was the hymn Loving Jesus, Gentle Lamb, played by organist and enthusiast of Compton Organs, Chris Lawton. Um, this week I'm mining YouTube um, so that every evening as we have our usual cycle of prayer for the churches uh, in different parts of the East Midlands, um, I'm finding organ music played in each of those parts. And I'm delighted to say that that, that was played for us on the magnificent Compton and Binns organ at Wellingborough United Reformed Church, uh, otherwise known as High Street URC. Um, Chris Lawton showing off its softer side there. Um, stay tuned for something rousing at the end. So welcome then to our evening prayers for Thursday the 18th of August. O oh God, make speed to save us. O oh Lord, make haste to help us. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright, in the congregation. Great are the deeds of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. The hands of the Lord work faithfulness and justice. All the commandments of the Lord are sure. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Instead of the regular Thursday night psalm, um, I've taken a few verses from one of those in the lectionary. This is um, a segment from Psalm 36. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your judgments are like the great deep. You save humans and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Well, Jane finished off for us last night the story of Micah and the Danites um, from the book of Judges. I'm very glad to discover that we skip the final story found in the book of Judges, which is jaw-droppingly appalling. Um, and we are returning to the book of Job, which I remember doing in the early days of these Facebook evening prayers. So um, it's come back round again. Job chapter 1. There was once a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He had seven thousand sheep, three thousand camels, five hundred yoke of oxen, five hundred donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and hold feasts in one another's houses in turn, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the feast days had run their course, Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This is what Job always did. One day, the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? 
Have you not put a fence around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand now, and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well, all that he has is in your power, only do not stretch out your hand against him. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. One day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the eldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were ploughing and the donkeys were feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell on them and carried them off and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, The Chaldeans formed three columns, made a raid on the camels and carried them off, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came across the desert, struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people and they are dead. I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell on the ground and worshipped. He said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrongdoing. In this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And for our second reading, let's continue through the book of Acts, chapter 8, 26 to 40. Continue to tell the stories of the evangelist Philip. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now, there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, and in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, Do you understand what you're reading? He replied, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, About whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself? Or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak. And starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, Look, here's water. What's to prevent me from being baptised? He commanded the chariot to stop. And both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water. And Philip baptised him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more. And went on his way, rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns, until he came to Caesarea. In this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
The hymn that the liturgy sets for Thursday evening is one that I struggled to find on YouTube. I found only one example of it being sung, but sung very beautifully. Uh, and it picks up that theme of happiness. And we had the Ethiopian sent away rejoicing um, as he returned to his homeland. Um, and here we have happy the souls Jesus joined and saved by grace alone. A poem by Charles Wesley. The Souls to Jesus Joined, sung by Akua Asantiwa, um, and accompanied, it looks like, by her young son. Let's hear tonight's Gospel reading. It's from John chapter 6, 16 to 27, and then I'll offer some shorter thoughts tonight. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark. And Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. The next day the crowd that had stayed on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there. They also saw that Jesus had not got into the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. In this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
and I've been clawed by a cat who wants something, so apologies if there are any interruptions. What to make of those passages tonight? We could contrast their moods from utter devastation of Job to the rejoicing um, of the, the Ethiopian convert. We could dwell on the, the strong winds that occur in two of the stories or the remarkable miracles, Christ walking on the waters and Philip apparently whisked away by the Holy Spirit instantaneously. But I think there's one question that links them all. Um, and it's, it's this, why does someone follow the path of righteousness? What wins souls to salvation or causes people to walk in the way of God? In that gospel reading, Jesus is clear of what it shouldn't be and what it should. This follows on from the, the feeding of the 5,000. Um, and now we get the crowd chasing Jesus incomprehendingly from pillar to post. It reminds me of uh, the life of Brian. They definitely read their gospel. Um, it's almost comic as they pursue from one side of the lake to another. Um, he doesn't think they are pursuing him because they have understood his word or been saved or, or crave his teachings, but because they crave another feeding. Now, I do wonder here whether Jesus had got the URC memo because um, the place of feeding and uh, celebratory cake and so forth, in my experience, um, features large in the church. But the point, of course, is that while shared meals are important, are even a holy habit, what's really important is that they lead on to food for the soul. That's the point. It's the point this crowd has not got. Turning to Job, what makes Job righteous? Is Job only godly because God gives him prosperity? The, the book of Job, which we begin tonight, is, is a kind of theological thought experiment, um, a kind of fable dramatised with God um, and Satan setting a wager to see whether Job can be can be brought to curse God's name. Satan says, "Yeah, it's, it's not all that impressive that he praises you when he when you have given him all this. Take it away, and we'll see what happens." And that leads to the cataclysm that we we read of tonight. A truly terrible, cruel deprivation of everything Job has all at once, including his ten children. So will Job be turned away from righteousness and curse God now that this kind of prototype of the prosperity gospel has been snatched away from him? Well, that will unfold in the following chapters, but we, we, we have a hint of the answer tonight um, at the end of the passage we heard when he fell on the ground and worshipped, said, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job's faith in the goodness of God, though terribly tested, is not something that relies on being blessed with riches and so forth. He doesn't follow God because God bribes him with good things. That's not how you come to God. For the Christian... I suppose the answer really is, it's the word. The word of scripture and the good news it contains. And of course, the word incarnate, incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth. Both are at play in that story from Acts of the Ethiopian. Philip the evangelist comes across him reading from the book of Isaiah and recognises that the prophecy it contains um, refers to Christ. The Lamb led to slaughter on our behalf. Um, and so it's by expanding that scripture, by, by expanding the word and sharing the good news that the Ethiopian comes to be baptised. What's really interesting in this passage as well 
I said it's not just about what leads leads him and to Christ. It's it's about who it is himself. Because the story of Acts, of course, is the tale of how um, the way of Jesus um, became more than just something for the Jewish people um, and began to expand all across the Eastern world um, and the Roman Empire. And here's where it begins. Now, different writers see this figure in slightly different ways. First of all, an Ethiopian doesn't mean he comes from what, what is now Ethiopia. Um, the clue, apparently, is that the Kandas is the term used for the queens of Kush, the ancient kingdom of Kush, which now lies in Sudan. Um, but he's certainly someone who comes from outside the, the Holy Lands. He is also not a eunuch. There are multiple possibilities for, for what that word ought to be translated into in, in modern English and for, for what, the, the, uh, what Luke who writes the book of Acts, really meant by that. Um, in modern terms, we might regard him in being in some sense into sex or transgender. Um, other writers um, reckon that the word is used to show he was gay or in some way queer. Um, and also, some writers claim that here is the first Gentile. It's either him or the, the Roman Cornelius, the first Gentile uh, to be baptised into the way of Jesus. It's really expansive and it's led by the Spirit and very clearly directing Philip. There are no limits on who Jesus is for. The Gospel is radically inclusive and here we have either either the first gentile or the first black person uh, the first queer person possibly all three being brought to jesus and that is the first person or one of the first outside the jewish nation to come to christ the food that endures for eternal life in jesus words is offered to all it truly is expensive. Even in our psalm tonight, Psalm 36, we heard, You save humans and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. God offers salvation to all. Amen. And so we turn to our Thursday evening prayers. Let us pray. Living God, in you there is no darkness. Shed upon us through this night the light of your forgiveness, your healing and your peace, that when we wake from sleep, we may know once more the brightness of your presence. Through our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. God of glory, you nourish us with your word, which is the bread of life. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, that through us the light of your glory may shine in all the world. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Blessed are you, sovereign God, our light and our salvation. To you be glory and praise for ever. In the beginning you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. To dispel the darkness of our night, you sent forth your Son, the firstborn of all creation. He is our Christ, the light of the world, and him we acclaim as all creation sings to you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, blessed be God for ever. and our intercessions. From the poverty of our lives, let us call to mind the needs of all creation. Let us pray for the church, that we may be open to the gifts of God's grace. Let us pray for the nations of the world, 
that the spirit of holiness may lead all people to peace. Tonight we think of all those nations caught up in conflict. And we think of those nations suffering the effects of climate change and peoples suffering human persecution on grounds of faith or identity. We lift them all before you, Lord. Let us pray for our local congregations that our love for one another may be a witness to the gospel. Tonight we celebrate the witness of our ministers, elders and members of our churches in Northamptonshire and of all our ecumenical partnerships in that county. We pray that their work may be pleasing in your eyes and we lift them before you, Lord. Let us pray for all those whose lives are shadowed by illness, poverty and distress, that justice may come to them. As we do every night, we pray for those who face the challenge of COVID-19 and also bring before you those who battle against COVID and other illnesses for our sake. We think of those with ailments of every kind, including people who live with, chro with chronic pain and long-term conditions, including senior citizens and everyone who is infirm or vulnerable, as well as for those who care for them. And remembering too, that as well as those who suffer physically, there are those whose mental health um, suffers, those who carry heavy burdens, sometimes entirely on their own, those living with complex family situations or work situations, those currently anxious and desperate over the rising cost of living. And tonight, particularly following today's A-level results, we may also think of um, some of those students who have faced disappointment uh, through the bad timing of, of being the year group who has had no other exams prior to their A-levels. Um, and they're subject to the, the adjustment of um, marks downward. For those who are disappointed, we pray that the path ahead may be clearer by the morrow. Just as we celebrate the success of those who are able to move on as they had planned and hoped. We lift them all before you, Lord. And we also bring before you those who especially ask our prayers this night. We pray with Liz her great nephew Ryan and for her daughter Emma with Celia for her brother-in-law Mike with Prince for Cheryl with Andy for his dad Mike and for Liz and Ruth in their care of Mike with Judith for her niece Catherine with Alison and all her family, for her dad, the Reverend Brian Russell. For the Reverend Martin Ferris and the Reverend Derek Hopkins as they continue to recover. For the Reverend Graham and Vera Maskery and for Moynia's parish priest, Father Andy. We lift them all before you, Lord. And let us pray for the departed, that they may be enfolded in the joys of heaven. Remembering all those who grieve the passing of loved ones, particularly at this time 
all who grieve, who grieve for Dave, especially for Sandy. I'm thinking also of Art, Onkatea, and Art's mother as they grieve for his father, Ave. We lift them all before you, Lord. Loving God, you illumine the night and order the moon and the stars. Grateful for your presence among us, we ask that you remember us as we pass through the shades of night and journey towards endless day. We ask this through Christ, our light. Amen. And let us say together the prayer that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Let us return then to Northamptonshire and to the organ at Wellingborough URC, High Street URC, played once again for us by Chris Lawton in a short hymn, Rejoice and Be Glad. whether tonight you are able to rejoice and be glad like the Ethiopian or your heart is filled with pain and bereavement like Job or you're somewhere in between may God be with you in the watches of this night the Lord bless us with his grace and fill us with his peace Amen Good night <laughs>